Okay, welcome to our February Ask a Physicist. Um, I'll get the announcements out of the way before we get started. And the first one is um, that our registration for the Beyond Annual Lecture is now open. It's going to be April 14th at 7 p.m. and we will have it in person in Marston Theater as well as virtually over Zoom. So the registration for each of those is on our, our Beyond website at beyond.asu.edu. Um, and then just regarding this evening, uh, as a reminder for those who haven't joined us, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can ask it at any point during the talk and we'll hopefully get to some of those at the end. And then um, our next Ask a Physicist will be on March 28th. And I'm gonna hand this over to our moderator for the evening, Paul, and he will share a little bit more about next month's Ask a Physicist. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jessica, and welcome to everybody. Uh, it's um, uh, the next uh, event in this Ask a Physicist series, we decided a good topic would be the James Webb Space Telescope, because it's very much in the news. Uh, and as you probably know, it's got to its uh, operating position in space and everything seems to be working. And we're very fortunate that ASU has people closely involved with this whole project or mission. And a couple of our colleagues will uh, be e explaining what the telescope is going to do, how it works, and answer your questions. So do join us. Uh, on uh, the last Monday in March for another Ask a Physicist on the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so uh, today we're changing the format a little bit. Uh, instead of having a couple of presentations, we're going to have a dialogue or a conversation uh, between uh, the, uh, my colleague, uh, Malik Parikh, an old regular for this Ask a Physicist series, and our very special guest, uh, today, Jana Levin. Now, Jana is a professor of physics and astronomy at Barnard College of Columbia University. She's a Guggenheim Fellow, and she's also a novelist. She wrote a novel called A Madman Dreams of Turing Machines, which won the Penn Bingham Prize. Uh, but she writes uh, other books as well, non-fiction books, including the one that's going to be the subject of this evening's um, discussion and a q and a session, which is a black hole survival guide. I should mention she's also a TV personality. Uh, she presented the Nova feature Black Hole Apocalypse on PBS. And uh, she tells me that she was the first female presenter on Nova for 35 years, which is truly shocking. And I think completely unacceptable. So good for you, Jana. Uh, and may we have more of the same, please. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Molik, who will say a little bit more about Jana's book and the nature of the conversation. So over to you. Thank you, Paul. Right. Thanks, Paul. So black holes is one of my favorite topics in all of physics. Uh, black holes, we're all kind of fascinated by black holes, I think, um, and maybe also a little bit scared. And that's because they touch on, I think, a kind of childhood fear that we have, a fear of the darkness and whatever might be lurking in it. Um, and especially if that, whatever it is, is going to sneak up stealthy, stealthily on us and devour us alive. So I think it's part of the reason we're fascinated by uh, great white sharks, for example, and maybe our uh, fascination with black holes is uh, so somewhat similar. But fear not, because today we have Jan 11, and she has written a book, which I think you can see here, called The Black Hole Survival Guide to help you with all your black hole problems. Uh, and so uh, here it is, don't leave us without it. Um, and so uh, with that said, let me just jump right into the physics. Uh, welcome, Jana. Great to Thanks, see you. Thanks, Malik. Also, maybe we should tell people that you and I are scientific collaborators. Yes, we have a paper together. That's right. Yeah. Do we only have one? Oh, shame. <laughs> yeah, we, we were talking about another paper on uh, charged black holes. All right, yeah. we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> so um, one of the things that you mentioned was, uh, is one of the things that sort of got you writing this book, I think, is the idea that 
black holes are not exactly what a lot of people expect. So why don't we start with that? Um, let's talk about just to set the stage what black holes are physically, what are their uh, sort of physical attributes? Well, I, that's, that's quite right. I think that to some extent, I was speaking out in defense of black holes, very cruel reputation as weapons of mayhem and destruction. And they can be that, of course, they can be that. But largely black holes are quiescent and they're, uh, they're quite small and quite benign. I think one of the misunderstandings is that they are enormous. And actually kind of the point of the black hole is that they're very, very small for their heft. And, uh, you know, if you took a star 10 times the mass of the sun, it's city sized. That's shockingly small. The sun's a million and a half kilometers across. And if you got a black hole 10 times the mass of the sun, 60 kilometers across. So they're actually quite small, quite isolated, quite hard to see. The reason why I think they got this reputation as weapons of mayhem and destruction is because the first times we saw them, something had veered precariously close and gotten itself in trouble, like a companion star. And, um, and yes, they will cannibalize a companion star and that will be very bright and very energetic. But essentially left to their own devices, you know, you're safer approaching a black hole than you are approaching the sun. That's right, you can actually, uh, what are the scales involved in there? You can, you can get, if you're a certain distance away from both the sun and the black hole, they're actually, a, they're, there's no difference from the sun and the black hole. They have the same gravitational field, right? In terms, right, in terms of the gravity. So like if, if some evil genius came along and turned the sun into a black hole, it would go from a million and a half kilometers to cross to six kilometers across. It would fit, you know, with my New York city frame of reference, it would fit in Central Park. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but our orbit would be perfectly fine. We would no more be sucked in, vacuumed up, torn apart than we are by the sun. There's actually a very unnoticeable difference between our orbit around a black hole at this great distance than our orbit around the sun, but it would be apocalyptically dark. So that would be bad yes. and cold and cold, much colder even than New York. <laughs> um. Right. So, uh, for example, I think if you, uh, you you give the example of the sun, but if you squashed a, uh, uh, the Earth into a black hole, uh, the entire mass of the Earth would, I think, fit in the size of a marble, right? Something like that. Yeah, it's like millimeters. Yeah. 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 It's like millimeters. Yeah. So, so, so I think that's the first misconception to dispel is that they're these monsters. They're actually tiny. Yes, you don't want to get too near. Um, and in some sense, the smaller the black hole, the more lethal, in some sense, you're better off, uh, as I, you know, warn you in the survival guide approaching a big black hole, the bigger the black hole, the safer you are, and the longer you'll survive, um, the smaller the black hole, the more hazardous, but right, if the earth were to become a black hole, it would be the size of a marble, indeed. And, and the other thing that's a bit surprising is what's actually inside them. So, uh, mm -hmm. well, so what is, what the amazing thing is that there's nothing inside them, right? Yeah. So that's right. A lot of people will, um, I, I, and again, these are perfectly fair misconceptions, but I love the idea of dispelling them. A lot of people will presume that a black hole is a very dense object. That's kind of their idea that you just make an object really, really dense and then it becomes a black hole. And to some extent, that is the way nature thought of to make a black hole, but that's not what the black hole is. So if you take a very heavy star, much bigger than the sun, and it runs out of nuclear fuel and it begins to collapse under its own weight, it will explode out in a supernova and the core that's left, if it's heavy enough, will continue to collapse. And at some stage, yes, it will become an incredibly dense object, unfathomably dense, but it will leave behind almost like an archeological record, this imprint on the shape of space, which is what we call the event horizon, the region beyond which not even light can escape the curves in space time. And then the star continues to fall 
And that's really interesting and important point. This is Roger, Sir Roger, Roger Penrose uh, received the Nobel Prize just quite recently for work he did in the 1960s, where he proved that the star could no more stay at that space-time region, the event horizon, than it could expand outward at the speed of light, that it would be forced to continue to collapse. And so the star falls and falls and falls and where it goes, really nobody knows. But what we do know is if you were to approach that shadow, when we talk about the size of a black hole, we're really talking about the size of the shadow. When you approach that shadow, there's nothing there anymore. So the star isn't the black hole. It was just a way nature thought of to make a black hole. And what it leaves behind is the black hole, which is basically nothing. It's empty space time. And, mm -hmm. and falling across the event horizon, the black hole should be no more dramatic than stepping into the shadow of a tree. Yeah, that's amazing, right? So the, yeah, it's quite amazing. So the black hole, as you sort of emphasize, is not really a thing, but a place. Yeah, uh, I, think, and... I think of a black hole as a place. Sometimes they act like things, but I'm quite emphatic in arguing that they are more a place than a thing. Yeah, uh, it's sort of like a pit and uh, you might have the star, the, the star have, might have dug the pit in its, while imploding, but, mm -hmm. uh, but the black hole isn't the star, it's, it's the pit itself. Um, exactly, the stuff is gone. Yeah. And it has to be gone because the, the point of the event horizon, which we very glibly say, and we repeat it a lot, and everyone says it at some point in their life, uh, the event horizon is the region beyond which not even light can escape. That's the phrase that we all say. Um, but it really has quite a profound meaning. If not even light can escape, it means nothing about the interior of the black hole, including what made it could possibly be relayed to the outside world. So the black hole, it doesn't matter if it was made by a star. It doesn't matter if it was made in the early universe just by initial conditions. It doesn't matter if it was made by that evil genius who tried to you know, destroy our sun. There is nothing about it that is distinguishable because if there was something about it that was distinguishable, it would mean somehow information had come to us from inside the black hole. And that's not possible because the limit of the communication of facts about the world is the speed of light. Yeah, so I think one of the reasons why we, uh, often think of a black hole as a thing rather than a place is because it's created by things in the form in yeah. the case of the collapsing star and it has mass. So how could it, uh, right. if, if there's nothing there, how could it have mass? Uh, but, but in fact it can, because in general relativity, there's a uh, relation between curve, the curvature of space and mass. And mm -hmm. although matter can curve space, space could just be curved on its own without that matter. Uh, yeah, and then, then and then it still has mass. I think yeah. that's a really subtle question that I wrestled with uh, describing. How can I, on the one hand, say that they're not things, but then say they've inherited the mass of the thing that formed it? But this is, to some extent, obviously, as you well know, not exactly, but it's to some extent e equals m c squared. It's just the energy of the star was imparted to the energy of the space-time. Yeah. And, and the curvature have... in the space-time has yeah. the same energy as though it was a, an isolated mass, yeah. And you can have that kind of energy in space-time even without having had the star. For example, right. in quantum yeah. gravity, there are these quantum fluctuations in which space-time can just uh, you know, fluctuate and you could have these pits form uh, in space yeah. and time. Uh, and they would just be formed without the benefit of actually having the star. And they would have mass. Yeah. yeah, the early universe could be formed with microscopic black holes as just part of its initial state. And those microscopic black holes would have an E equals MC squared sort of a kind of an energy, but it wouldn't be having anything to do with matter at all, nor dead stars. It would have only to do with the shape of the space time. Right. In fact, um, you know, we could, we, there was a fear of, uh, at, at, uh, that we would produce these black holes at the Large Hadron Collider in, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, and there's yeah. sort of there's no star over there, but it's just there's a certain amount of energy within a certain radius called the Schwarzschild radius, and that's enough yeah. to uh, form microscopic black holes. Yeah, and uh, uh, people were really upset about this. And I don't know, maybe we're doing a poor job as physicists to say things like it's a, just a very low probability, <laughs> because as a physicist, you can't say there's no probability. <laughs> um, there was a very small, unlikely probability that in uh, smashing particles together at the Large Hadron Collider, we would have made these little tiny microscopic black holes. And people were very upset about that because, you know, there were these adory, adorable sort of animations of them consuming the earth. But in reality, we know that quantum black holes, very, very small black holes are highly unstable. They basically explode like firecrackers. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back, we'll come to those uh, uh, later. Um, but let's talk about a little bit about uh, the experience of somebody who falls into the black hole. So uh, a lot of people have heard about spaghettification where we can just touch on that. And, but also uh, what's it like, uh, you know, looking outside, for example, as you follow. Yeah, it. yeah. So, uh, in the spirit of dispelling myths about black holes, um, you can, as the character behind me is doing, fall inside the event horizon, and it would be very undramatic. You would just be falling through space, but you would notice not that uh, the world had become dark because. Um, black holes aren't necessarily dark on the inside. And that's, that's one of these really cool little facets that they're dark on the outside because they won't let anything out, but they let anything in. <laughs> so it's a total one-way mirror. So if you were to fall into the black hole, the light from the galaxy could easily fall behind you and you would, it would catch up to you and your trajectory. And you could see millennia pass in the galaxy. You could see civilizations come and go, new species arise, uh, you could see new stars formed, and for you it would be a flash in your total lifetime. From the outside, you could very safely set yourself up in orbit, kind of like how the ISS is set up in orbit around the Earth. And you could sit there and uh, watch as your companion astronaut made this terrible journey into the black hole. But from your perspective, it would seem as though it was taking nearly forever for the astronaut to finally fall in, your friend, even though for them, it might be a matter of minutes. And uh, that's just one of the peculiar attributes of the relativity of space time. Yeah, so there's some strange things that happen with time, right? So first yeah. of all, uh, for the person who falls in, um, they're going to, I like to think of it as, a, a, as the, the event horizon as, as one of these heavily tinted windows that you have of these cars sometimes. And mm -hmm. so you, can, you can't see who's inside, but what's inside, but the right. people inside can see what's outside. Right, uh, exactly. And, and so you're inside, if you fall into a black hole, then uh, the light from outside can still come in. And because right. of what happens with time, uh, you will see the depending on your trajectory, sort of, you'll see the entire history of the universe in, in a flash. So it's not just your life passing by, but it's a totally. universe. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. You, 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 will, you will find out what happened with our climate crisis. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 but whereas if you stay on the outside, you actually never see anybody fall into a black hole. Uh, you can, if you yeah. drop something into a black hole, it'll never actually make it there. Um, so this is one of the problems on my general relativity exam when I was in graduate school. And uh, that's absolutely true what you're saying. But if I include the curvature of space time due to the astronaut herself, yes, it will actually be a finite time. That'll so be a very long time because basically the event horizon, and we see this when two black holes collide, the event horizon bubbles Trump around up. the mass. Yeah. And then it rings off the imperfection of that bubble in what we call gravitational waves, because black holes will not tolerate any imperfections. And so actually, while it will take longer than the lifetime of your companion back on the space-time orbit, you know, the, the stable orbit outside the black hole, 
you will in a finite time eventually even to somebody outside fall in but it's true if as you reduce the energy and the mass of that astronaut it it gets closer and closer to basically forever right great so there's kind of a gravitational back reaction right, right. so like i'm I'm disturbing gravity right now, but obviously incredibly minutely. Gravity is incredibly weak. Like here I am with just my wee little arms and the entire earth is pulling on me <laughs> and I can still, you know, no problem. <laughs> Gravity's staggeringly weak. So my mass and my distortion of space time is so negligible. Um, but if you do things like you try to uh, watch, which we have, the collision of two black holes where both are of comparable size you absolutely see the distortion of the event horizon bubble around the two black holes and then ring off those imperfections in the gravitational waves until it settles down to one quiescent perfect black hole right and um okay so let's continue talking about time in uh, yeah in the inside yeah. Uh, so in a way, from the point of view of the outside observer, if we take, if we disregard the effect you said about uh, yeah. Back yeah. Reaction, gravitational back reaction of mm -hmm. modifying yourself, modifying the space time, you're sort of going beyond infinite time, right? You're right. Sort of, from the outside point, point of view, time is infinite there, and you're the person who fell in and sort of going beyond infinite. Yeah. And another strange, so another strange thing inside is, uh, so there's a singularity inside where mm -hmm. the laws of physics break down. But the strange yeah. thing about the singularity is, is that it's not a place. Uh, it's not that you can, right. it's not like that uh, Sarlacc pit in the Return of the Jedi, where, 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 where which you're sort of drawn to and you will get crushed right. in. It's it's actually a moment in time. Uh, it's yeah. like five so p.m. Wild. on Thursday or something. Um, it's you know. so beautiful. This is where the math leads you to a greater intuition than your experience can lead you to. And as we all know, including Paul, this took decades to figure out. It's not at all obvious. And so while we recite these uh, facets of the black hole that we've learned, it really took an entire community to try to crack this problem. But as you said, from the outside of the black hole, it's as though your companion who's falling in, as though space and time are rotating into each other, just like left and right can rotate into each other, but more complicated. <laughs> and as your companion approaches the black hole, it's as though time and space have rotated maximally. And so what you thought from the outside was the center of a sphere in space to your companion has rotated entirely into time. And they believe as they cross the event horizon, not just believe, but they're a hundred percent physical factual experience is that the singularity that you're describing is in their future. It is not a point in space at all. It is a point in time and they can no more avoid the inevitability of crashing into that singularity than they can avoid the passage of time. So that is why uh, people discuss the interior of black holes as being unsurvivable. And, you know, spoiler alert, the book doesn't end well. <laughs> There's no surviving a black hole. <laughs> There's a great line at the end, but I'll leave you to the, uh, <laughs> the book. <clears throat> Thank you. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I like to think of the singularity. Uh, so singularity is kind of a time. It's like, uh, you know, five o'clock on next Thursday or something. And you can no, yeah. lo no more avoid running yeah. into five o'clock Thursday. Uh, well, you, exactly. no matter how you wriggle and squirm and fire engines, uh, rocket engines this way. All that, you like. You right. can do whatever you like, but you're going to run into that time. And that's the end. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's why death in the center of a black hole is inevitable if you actually cross the horizon. Yeah. But you can safely stay outside. You know, you can be... Uh, so let's say a black hole, 10 times the mass of the sun, 60 kilometers across, you know, you could be three times further out, which is really close. It's closer than we are right now, Malik. And right. be perfectly fine. Be in a stable circular orbit and just watch all of this craziness unfold. Yeah, that's a lot. As you said, that's a lot uh, 
you can get a lot closer than you can get to the sun if you went back right you, you know i can't i can't I, if we went to venus it would be real bad yeah. <laughs> real bad all right so uh let's talk about something else that you, uh, you mentioned which is that you said that the if you disturb a black hole by throwing something in it so the black hole mm -hmm. sort of wobbles and sort of absorbs whatever you threw and it right. might have been some lump it could have been an asteroid or something and so the black right. hole's surface will sort of bulge up to consume bubble up to consume yeah. this thing but then it will shake off its if it's uh sort of imperfections uh, yeah. as gravitational waves and become a perfect like literally yeah. perfect sphere perfect right yeah that's so we can't i can't emphasize that enough exactly do you want me to talk about the perfection? Go ahead, talk about the perfection. Well, that is unlike anything else that's macroscopic yeah. in the universe. It is absolutely peculiar. So if I look at something microscopic, like an electron, I'm accustomed to it being perfect. An electron has a very specific mass, a very specific spin, a very specific charge, and I can list its attributes. And every single electron is identical, utterly indistinguishable. There is no, this is my electron. <laughs> my electron has a freckle, <laughs> you know, they're utterly perfect, meaning featureless and completely indistinguishable. The only macroscopic phenomenon that I'm aware of um, that has that in common with elementary fundamental particles um, are black holes. And uh, they can be characterized similarly to a fundamental particle by their mass, their charge, and their spin. And every black hole with those quantities is indistinguishable, absolutely indistinguishable from every, every other black hole with those parameters. And that is bizarre. And it also suggests something very peculiar about black holes. So, you know, obviously I'm not indistinguishable from every other person. You're not indistinguishable from every other person. It's not, uh, chairs are not indistinguishable. Everything has flaws, imperfections, differences. You know, planets have mountains, so they're not perfectly round. Black holes don't have mountains. They will not tolerate mountains. They will shake off any imperfection and radiate it away in the ringing of space-time until they settle down to be absolutely featureless. And I think that suggests even very, very early on in the history of understanding black holes, something very profound because they're the only uh, phenomena we can imagine that are, like microscopic particles, but on an absolutely different scale, that there's no limit to how big a black hole can be. And still it will behave like something fundamental. So I think black holes have been telling us for a long time that they're giving us clues about our very understanding of the fundamental laws of nature. Yeah, so they're, as you said, they're sort of classical objects that giant objects that behave really like particles. So an electron is characterized by essentially, or most fundamental particles are characterized by their mass, their charge, and their spin. Yeah. And that's also what we use to characterize a black hole. It, it's defined by how much mass there is, whether there's electric charge, in reality, astrophysical black holes right. are unlikely to have too much of that, and whether they're spinning or not, and how much, how fast right. they're spinning. That's, that's it. it, three numbers. Just three numbers will characterize right. every single black hole. Uh, in, in world, universe. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, well, that's probably telling us something deep, right? And I think one- It's probably that... telling us something deep, yeah. And I, I think uh, the fact that there exists an event horizon is the reason why people understood this very early on, that the fact that no uh, facts about how the black hole form can possibly make it out of the black hole. So for instance, if I threw you, Malik, my friend, into the black hole and it retained an imprint of your arrival inside the black hole on its shape, then it would be telling me some information about what was going on inside. And, and the event horizon says that that's forbidden. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be allowed to know 
that you fell in or, uh, you know, I threw a car in or something else. And so it was understood very early, as you know, it's, they're called the no hair theorems, that black holes can't have hair, meaning they can't have sort of distinguishable features. It, it's not exactly what it means, but we'll do that for this, this purpose. Um, but it's been around for a long time that people have been kind of scratching their heads, like, well, what does it mean that black holes are indistinguishable and they act like fundamental particles, but they can be not just city size, they can be solar system size. They can be billions of times the mass of the sun. They can be as large as our solar system. And honestly, if you left them alone and didn't throw anything around them, they would still look like fundamental particles. So they seem to be challenging us to push the boundaries of what we understand about microscopic versus macroscopic. Yeah, I think there's some thing like, maybe there's even a duality between uh, particles and, and uh, black holes. Uh, there's some yeah. hint of that in string theory where uh, if you have weak coupling and the excitation of the string look like, a, look like uh, particles, but if you have strong coupling, they look like black holes. Yeah, uh, so do you think that, um, so this idea of dualities has, has been incredibly fruitful the idea that uh, things look like they get really difficult on a small scale, but if you realize it's dual, it has another interpretation on the large scale, suddenly it's easier to talk about and we can use that kind of a dictionary. Do you think that, that these ideas about black holes being featureless has been hinting at duality long before string theory? Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't know really what to make of the fact that they're uh, that they are, uh, they look like elementary particles because simply because they are classical objects. It's not like if we really were to describe them quantum mechanically, maybe they would yeah. they would be quite like that. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Right, they are. That's quite true. That's the difference. That's the difference is that they're they're classical objects. But again, that's sort of just a question of scale because. If we made microscopic black holes in the primordial universe, they wouldn't be classical objects. They would have a cloud around them the way electrons do. Um, yeah. So it's really just that they defy the rules by being so big. Right. Or, you know, some of them at least are by being so could big. I, could I chip in with a, a few questions? Oh, Paul, getting, awesome. A lot of questions. And, uh, oh, yeah. Awesome. And, yeah. And I, I just want to make, uh, uh, well, ask one question myself. Uh, Please. Because the audience will want to hear about this. So Stephen Hawking um, coined the term spaghettification in connection with falling into a black hole. W would you explain what that is? Yeah. So I think a lot of people anticipate that this horrible experience of spaghettification would happen at the event horizon, but uh, kind of maybe counterintuitively, the bigger the black hole you fall into, the less likely you are to experience this at the event horizon. And if you imagine standing on the earth, you don't really notice the curvature that much. But if you stand on a basketball, you absolutely notice the curvature. So in some sense, the curvature is more important for a smaller black hole, which seems kind of surprising. But what happens in spaghettification is precisely that you notice that your two feet are kind of on different points on the curve. So what can happen is that your feet are accelerating towards, and this would presumably happen inside the black hole, not, not at the event horizon, but deep inside, your feet begin to accelerate towards the singularity more rapidly, for instance, than your head. And so you become, you know, a Giacometti, <laughs> um, like my poor friend in my background here. <laughs> and um, not only that, but also like a basketball, you start to notice that your two feet are kind of pointing in different directions. And so you're also being crushed <laughs> at the same time as you're being stretched. And presumably the space time is so unstable there that again, this issue of your own mass makes it uh, highly disrupted. And, um, and we're quite uh, confident that if no other, no other law of physics interrupts, which it probably does, but if it's only gravity all the way down, that you will be torn to your fundamental quantum bits. And, uh, 
And, you know, that's, that's pretty possible. much the end of you. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to derail your uh, fascinating conversation, but can I throw in a few questions? Please. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of questions from the viewers. Yeah. And this won't be in any particular order because some of them can be dealt with with a sort of yes, no answer. So we have a, a question from Nancy Abrams. So how how does a black hole? Hi, Nancy. Charge? Is that Nancy, our 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 Nancy, Nancy friend of astronomy? So, I'm assuming um, so. Hi, Nancy. Um, um, how so how can black have holes charge? have a charge? That's that's a really uh, good question. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, Black holes can consistently have a charge and um, not violate what we were calling the no hair theorems. Um, and uh, it's uh, maybe a little awkward to explain why, but uh, it's- but, but, how, but the question is how? how? How would a black hole- occur? Oh, if I, if I chose to- uh, if I if I chose to throw a bunch of electrons into a, a neutral black hole, a black hole that had no charge, but I I threw in you know a handful of electrons, it will absolutely inherit the charge of the electrons, exactly in the same way it inherits their mass. And in a realistic astrophysical setting, is it like very good question? Excellent question. So I've been working on this quite a lot the past five years or so. Um, the canonical answer several years ago would have been no, because there's so much charge available in the universe from gas and dust and winds and debris and electromagnetism, unlike gravity is incredibly strong that it will neutralize right away. Because if I threw a handful of electrons into a black hole, they will very easily electromagnetically attract a bunch of positrons or protons or whatever's out there to neutralize because electrical neutrality is like a low energy state. And so it wants to fall towards that state. This turns out not to be true. And it is absolutely true if uh, the black hole isn't spinning, but if the black hole is spinning and it's in a magnetic field and not to get too technical, but there's lots of magnetic fields out there. The energetically neutral state is for a black hole to be charged. And this is something that my group and I have been uh, pressing on for quite some time, that it is, no, it is not uh, reasonable to presume that black holes are electrically neutral because we know that they're immersed in enormous magnetic fields. And when they spin in magnetic fields, um, for very subtle reasons, they actually prefer to acquire charge. That is the electrical low energy state. So if you think of a ball rolling down a hill, it wants to fall to the lowest state. And in this particular case, the lowest state is actually for black hole to be charged. So we have been arguing that um, black holes are much more likely to be charged than they are to be electrically neutral. And of course, as and, you they're also spinning because right, much it's the spin the spins exactly, and uh, that's, that's crucial. In its own right. That's crucial because if it stops spinning, uh, it 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 also wants to discharge. This is work that was due to Bob Wald, who, of course, both Paul and Malik know, who is a brilliant general relativist from like 1974. He wrote a paper that's like four pages long. That's absolutely gorgeous where he kind of, uh, he, 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 he finds the description of how a black hole behaves in a spinning, when it's spinning in a magnetic field. And Brandon Carter, who uh, you also both know, suggested to him, why don't you figure out what the low energy state is? Is it really electrically neutral? And it's not. Um, and it's a very overlooked result. It's 50 years old. And we've started to press on that very strongly because we know black holes spin. It is the natural, as you said, Paul, when things collapse, they just spin faster and faster, like the ice skater pulling the arms in. And we also know that there are magnetic fields everywhere. And, and, uh, and when that happens, the black hole not only can acquire charge, but it can become like a pulsar. It can become a black hole pulsar because a spinning charge will have its own magnetic field and it will be able to beam 
charged particles from around those magnetic fields. So there is the possibility of some of, of this idea of a black hole pulsar. We got lots of questions. I'm going to sort of go through them with a gallop. I won't always uh, have a second name on my screen, but Vishesh mm -hmm. is asking, uh, how, do, how can we watch the collision of two black holes if no light can escape? It, it's, uh, a, it's a very good question. I, I, I misspoke. I it was using watch metaphorically, and I'm really glad for this question because we actually listen to it. We don't watch it. Um, it's gravitational wave. It's the gravitational waves, which if you imagine like a ringing drum, like the black holes are mallets and they're banging on the drum of space time and the ringing drum creates these ripples in space time. Technically it's feasible, although nobody, I don't, I haven't done the calculation, but if you were floating hazardously closely that your eardrum would in fact ring in response and that you would actually hear the ringing drum. But instead, we build these instruments, which I kind of like into electric guitars, which record the ringing of the space time and play it back to us as sound. And I think it's a really good question because the first event that was ever detected by the instrument called LIGO was the most powerful event human beings have ever recorded since they detected the Big Bang. And none of it came out as light. None of it. And there's no way we would ever see it. But we heard it. And that's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah it's a ripple. It's a ripple in space time, and the typical frequencies are often audible. Uh, oh, it's I don't a good think point. You can actually, I don't think we can actually hear it because they're transverse instead of longitudinal. Uh, and so well, maybe, okay, you know more maybe, about human anatomy than I do. I don't know if their ears would respond to that, uh, but, <laughs> but but they are in the right frequency range, uh, so so we can certainly play them back. Uh, uh, on maybe, maybe you'd like to to answer Barbara Temple's uh, question about using. Uh, a black hole as a, a time travel device. So if you're in orbit around it, can you leap into the future? Well, this is the, the black hole will allow you to leap into someone else's future, but not your own. Right. Okay. And it is a type of time machine if you- In uh, that sense. So if you and your twin are astronauts in orbit around a black hole, and one of you decides to veer hazardously close, but doesn't cross the event horizon and comes back, you will uh, be in the future of your twin. Your twin will be older than you, um, but you can't be in your own future just from a black hole. Well, that was- Malik, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, that was beautifully depicted in this movie Interstellar where, uh, mm -hmm. where the astronaut goes, close to the black hole and comes back and his, his own daughter is much older than him when he returns. Yeah, you know, I, if you, it's really simple. It's surprisingly simple calculation how close you would have to be for that to happen. And it's insanely close. Yeah. That's the thing about, again, about black holes. It, you know, you have to be in ridiculously close to the event horizon, like atoms close. This was um, a very expensive mission. Right, because, right, Paul, you're alluding to the fact that it costs you a lot of fuel to get back. Right. And the closer you get, it really costs maybe all the fuel available in your entire solar region, or solar system to get back. But we're brushing over that. Now, I want to uh, pick up a, a topic that uh, Christian uh, van der Sander, it's truncated there, maybe that's not your whole name, I apologize if it's not, uh, is asking. But you've been sort of dodging around the issue of what's happening at the center of the black hole. Um, uh, Johnny, you said, well, nobody really knows. Uh, we often use this term singularity. There's a singularity there, uh, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that. Um, but, uh, uh, and you we also mentioned that it's really in the future uh, rather than a point in space. Um, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's really a placeholder, isn't it, for uh, what we don't know. Uh, do you want yeah. to... Uh, uh, both of you, I'd like to you to offer some conjectures uh, as yeah. to if we understood more about this singularity. You know, would it be a real edge or boundary of space time, or would it be a portal yeah. to another universe, or would yeah. it be something we haven't even thought of yet? Uh, that's beautiful. So I'll I'll try this and then I'll throw it to Malik. Um, even in the 1965 paper in which Sir Roger. Uh, 
described the inevitability of the collapse of matter to singularities, which won him the Nobel Prize. He said in the same paragraph in which he proves it that ah, this probably isn't right. <laughs> he basically says, you know, this ignores quantum phenomena and this ignores the quantum nature of matter. And if that were included, probably these singularities would go away. Not the event horizon, right? That is solid. But he says these singularities, mm, they're probing really small scales and uh, they're like magnifying glasses on the microscopic universe. And so they really can't uh, be concluded. Their existence can't be, not only can't be concluded with confidence, but it's pretty likely that they're telling us something's wrong. Um, but the, the one thing I want to hitch onto before I pass to Malik is the idea that when people were like, yeah, we should ignore these singularities, they tried to kind of sew the interior of a black hole onto a Big Bang model. And by that, I mean, we think space times, we're not saying it's predicted, but if you can sew things together smoothly, like you sew, sew a quilt together, uh, then, you know, it's plausible. <laughs> And uh, you can smoothly stitch together a Big Bang inside a black hole, which means that black holes, even if they're only city sized on the outside, they can be as big as universes on the inside. And while that's not the most popular resolution of what happens to the singularity, it does drive home the point that they're like Doctor Who's TARDIS, right? They're bigger on the inside than they are on the outside. Yeah, the eventual horizon is really a portal. Uh, it's not like the exterior of the black hole encloses in a sphere of that size. It's sort of a portal into another, uh, basically a collapsing universe. Uh, and then you can imagine that that collapsing universe um, goes into a the big bang of another universe, and then you come out of these white holes, which are these hypothetical um, mirror images, if you like, of, of black holes, where you can only come out and not go in. Uh, and so that has an appealing idea that if you fall into a black hole, you might go through the singularity and then come out of, into another universe uh, through the mouth of a white hole and you'll appear there. Um, that's a, a theoretical possibility, but uh, nobody actually really believes that that's going to be the case because uh, it, it's a very unstable possibility that um, very unstable. slightly perturb the, uh, the geometry, it, it all falls apart. But also, you know, it's kind of a sweet uh, consolation prize to the spaghettification because your quantum bits, which you were torn, you know, you were torn to shreds in your quantum bits would become part of a bigger ecosystem. Right. Your pasta in a million years. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, let, let me just uh, uh, deal uh, briefly myself with um, mm -hmm. uh, Anonymous, who has is asking... Uh, how can, there, if there's no communication between the inside and the outside of a black hole, how can we talk about what's inside? Uh, we are theoretical physicists. We've never been known to not talk about things. <laughs> yes. We, we, base, uh, we base our uh, understanding of what goes on inside black holes on the general theory of relativity, our best understanding yeah. of space-time and gravitation. It's a theoretical extrapolation only and yeah. as Jana has been at pains to point out we can never ever know uh, because once our companion has plunged into the black hole uh, they cannot tell us uh, whether we got the theory right so it's an yeah. extrapolation of theory but very well it, very well it is theory. but you know this brutalism that we ought not contemplate what can't be contemplated I uh, object to because it's precisely in that struggle that we begin to poke holes in our own presumptions of what's true and what's real. And we realize that general relativity, as gorgeous as it is, and as much as I love it, and I do love it, <laughs> is not the whole story. It may not be the last and, word. And there is quantum mechanics. It might not be the last word. And we are forced, especially in the singularity, to face quantum mechanics because the singularity is talking about the very small and the very high energy. It is demanding that we talk about things in a quantum way. And it, you know, it might even be to the point where, yeah, maybe we through quantum mechanics can get intel on what's inside a black hole. 
And so this, you know, brutal, the event horizon lets nothing out. And Malik has actually done really beautiful work on this and thought about this, um, you know, is overstated because we've forgotten about literally the loopholes of quantum loops. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, as we contemplate them, you know, it just gets more interesting. Yeah, we didn't even get to talk about Hawking radiation and quantum black holes. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> it's late over here in New York. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we, we have quite a lot of questions, so that's why I'm galloping through this. Uh, uh, Please. Ben and Mamiri asked the first question, has been waiting very patiently. Um, uh, and we're going to have to deal with this one very quickly. How are black holes formed? And of course, mm -hmm. there are several different ways in which they might form. Um, but uh, uh, I guess I can I can tell uh, uh, Benham that, uh, that the collapse of, of large stars is the, the one that we most talk about. But they're also supermassive black holes. Right, the exactly. And the formation of those is mystifying. Absolutely. So I, I'm really glad you said that. So absolutely, this is why I often try to distinguish for people dead stars aren't black holes. They're just one way that they're formed. And the supermassive black holes, which are millions or billions, or even in some cases, trillions of times the mass of the sun are inexplicable in terms of stellar collapse. They did not form from stellar collapse. And maybe they just collapsed out of the primordial universe. We don't really know, but, uh, um, but uh, we can't say black holes are synonymous with collapsed stars. One of the amazing, really extraordinary things about black holes is the sheer uh, scale of different sizes that they can come in. So, yeah. uh, black hole, the smallest possible black hole is, I think, about 22 micrograms, uh, which is... It's like a pile of sesame seeds. Pile of sesame seeds, thank you. Yes, but um, much smaller than the a largest atomic one, particle. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's how much it weighs, not how big it is. It's very, very Exactly. Large. Yeah. Um, and the, the largest one that we have is about uh, 20 billion times the mass of the sun, uh, as far as I know, right? Something like that. That's the largest one we've found so far. So I'm, uh, I'm not sure I will trust you on that. Uh, okay, uh, there about, <laughs> right? But, but actually, there's no uh, formal limit. That's just the one biggest one right. we, we have found. There right. could be even larger ones. So there's actually right. no real scale. And so yeah. here we have this object, the same kind of class of objects, which yeah. exists on 48 orders of magnitude in size. In, in mass. Yeah. So yeah. uh, th that, to me, strongly suggests that the real description of it is in some scale invariant theory. And that's sort of what we see in string theory, where there's a conformal field theory that describes it. Which is why, you know, uh, uh, I think it's interesting that we couldn't have predicted it because we didn't have the language of string theory. We weren't thinking about dualities. But we actually had evidence of this scale invariance very early on. Yeah. There just wasn't a context to extrapolate what the implications were. Now, if we had a black hole that was really, really big, we could be inside one right now. Uh, that, that's what Daniel is asking. Is that right? Well, I mean, I've calculated this. It's been a while. I feel like I gave it on a final. Um, how big a black hole would you have to fall into and which specific orbit would you have to assume to live one year? <laughs> and I think it's like a trillion times the mass of the sun. <laughs> but but if, uh, yeah. if the whole universe <laughs> was something like the inside of a black hole, it was a it's pretty <laughs> tough, man. I mean, first of all, that black hole would be bigger than the universe, which we know that is forbidden. So while Malik was absolutely right in saying there's no limit to how big a black hole can be in theory, there's a limit to how big a black hole can be in practice. It has to be smaller than the observable universe. Right. Um, and that, and again, they're heavy, but they're small. So no, you can't really fit the observable universe into something very tiny relative to the observable universe. Well, let's uh, let's move on for that. Uh, but Barbara's got another question about over this time about Doctor Who, which is always welcome, of course, on these in these sorts of discussions. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, once on Doctor Who, a black hole was depicted as a gateway to an antimatter universe. Uh, mm. What do you think about that? Is that plausible? I mean, completely plausible. Um, 
there's to some, I mean, I don't know, Malik, maybe you're going to disagree, but we don't really know why matter is preferred over antimatter. They're just names we give to things. Uh, and we don't know that in each big bang, if there is a big bang that's inside the black hole and there's new conditions that it wouldn't be the other way around. Right. That so antimatter wouldn't dominate. Bit, and if you went through a black hole, came out another universe could be broken the other way. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you know, the pencils. For Doctor Who, I assume, Jana. <laughs> yeah, I'm available for hire. So like the, you know, pencils standing up on their end can fall to the left, but they could also fall to the right. Yes, in the same way, matter and antimatter are just sort of arbitrary uh, choices. Yeah. Yeah. Here's an excellent question. If I, there's, there's one question that I'd like to actually, uh, Devon Sanders asks, uh, any right. practical applications for black holes if we had the means to interact or manipulate them, not weapons? Uh, I, I think that uh, there's a, a beautiful thing called the Penrose process, uh, and uh, in which Ooh. if you have a rotating black hole, you can extract its rotational energy. And it's actually one of the most efficient ways to get energy uh, from, so you're literally getting energy out of the shape of space time. You're drawing out the energy by unwinding the black hole, uh, mm -hmm. by extracting the energy stored in space. And uh, I forget what the exact figure is, but it's it's something, it's about- 20%. 20%? Yeah, it's much more efficient than a, a nuclear. 27 uh, and a half or something? 20, 20 something, yeah, 20 yeah. something. But I actually, I'm really glad you brought this up because, so I just recently, uh, just in the fall, um, published a paper with um, an undergraduate, uh, Shitaj Gupta, and, uh, Gupta, and uh, a graduate student, um, uh, Albert Law, who's now at Harvard as a postdoc, and we looked at the Penrose process with charged black holes. And we found that while the mechanical Penrose process that you're describing beautifully unwinds the spin of the black hole until it uses up all of that reserve is in the 20 percentage um, that if you uh, charge it up, if it's a spinning black hole in a magnetic field, you can extract huge energies. And so we're looking at this for the image that's behind Malik right now, um, which is the Event Horizon Telescope image of the first actual picture we've ever taken of a black hole. And we believe that the, the light that we're seeing is so close to the Event Horizon that we might be able to see some consequences of things like the Penrose process for the first time. Um, so, so it's funny how these kinds of classical astronomical observations are motivating us to do these like very theoretical predictions, which we previously thought were nice, but you know, not verifiable. Yeah. We're, um, we're running out of time, uh, which is important because uh, you need to either get your dinner or go to bed, Jana. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, get my dinner. <laughs> but, but it would be remiss of me uh, to pull the plug on this uh, fascinating conversation without once again, mentioning your book because we've touched on a lot of topics there have been questions that we haven't got around to things involving entanglement uh, quantum entanglement across event horizon and so on deep and complicated subjects that would require mm -hmm. an entire uh, one hour in themselves um, mm -hmm. but uh, presumably uh, many of these topics you touch on in your black hole survival guide uh, so i can uh, recommend that um, and otherwise, uh, I, I guess these questions remain somewhere. Jessica can tell us, and maybe uh, Molig, you and John you can tweet me, could uh, or or tweet you, uh, could uh, deal with some that we haven't got around to. Yeah, I, I don't mind actually staying on and just answering them on the chat. Uh, That's so I nice. I, I I assume that yes, is yes, possible. I I would not want this to. <laughs> To end with a whimper, I would like to, uh, <laughs> to thank everybody, including uh, Jessica, who uh, is behind the scenes running the show, um, but also to remind uh, you know, our, our loyal listeners, viewers, I don't know what you call Zoomers, uh, about uh, the Beyond Annual Lecture coming up, uh, which is, uh, uh, I've forgotten the date, I think April the uh, 14th, uh, and it's yes. by... Um, uh, an astronaut, uh, 
Chan, as I uh, uh, pronounce her name. She pronounces it Sian, I think. Uh, and she'll be uh, talking, well, I can't remember the title, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Jessica could probably remind us. Uh, and the next uh, Ask a Physicist is going to be on the subject of the James Webb Telescope. Uh, yes, so here we are. Uh, Sian Proctor is going to talk about Space to Inspire the New Space Age. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, sorry, I didn't have that at my fingertips. Um, so, Jana, uh, you must uh, be free to go uh, and get your dinner. And thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Jana. Great to see informative you. and entertaining presentation Thanks. this evening. It's fun to and, talk to uh, both of you. Hope, we hope you'll come back for future Ask a Physicist. Uh, meanwhile, yeah. um, Molik, if you are happy to stay on, then yeah, the chat channel, I think, can stay open, or the Q&A channel, and you yeah. could perhaps deal with some of those questions. I'll do that. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Jenna. Bye. 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 See you. Till soon. We talk about charged black holes. I'll send you an email. Indeed. Soon. <laughs> All right. Bye. So, Jessica, can this remain open, or is there... <laughs>